I thought I would have six kids. <laughs> uh, well, I got two. Uh, but yeah, I'm happy. You know, I, I really think for me, success is being happy. Uh, success is uh, feeling that you're living your purpose. And I really believe I am living my purpose. And that's what success is for me. I am an Africa. Africa, where it all began. The credo of humankind. Rich in culture. Diversity of resources. The silver, the gold, and its people. Legacy, passing down something of value. Resources, ideas, information from one generation to another. There cannot be any success in your lives without the willingness to live with what you regard as inconceivable. African Legacy Project. They inspire and build. We all have many gifts, many talents and passions. Making a success out of them all, however, is a different story altogether. As it's often been said, the dream is free, but the hustle is sold separately. Chairman of the Megani Group, Dr. Judith Lamini, who's a qualified medical doctor with multiple interests in education, property, fashion, and retail, shares with us her story and her legacy. She has mastered them all. This is African Legacy Project. My name is Judy Lamini. I'm the founder and the executive chairman of Mbegani Group, and I'm from South Africa. I was born in Westville, uh, late, uh, actually to be specific, in 1959. And uh, yeah, it was interesting times. Uh, uh, I actually, it was during that transition uh, in, in, in terms of Preparers Act. So there weren't many uh, African families where uh, our house was. Uh, so I was stuck with my siblings uh, as playmates, uh, my late sister Rainy and uh, my late brother Charles. So yeah, it was fun, but uh, I had to make sure that uh, I make them happy because if they're not happy with me, then I didn't have playmates. So it was quite tricky, especially with my brother. We had to, it was either his way or no play. So yeah, it was an interesting time. My mother was a primary school teacher and uh, my dad was, a, he had a painting contractor, he worked for himself. Uh, yeah, and uh, my mother was just one of those hustlers. Uh, she had the day job of being a primary school teacher. Uh, at night, she would teach uh, at night school uh, domestic servants uh, for free just to empower them. Uh, but then she would come back and she would uh, make snacks that she would sell at school to supplement her income and then she would also knit jerseys and uh, make um, petticoats and children's clothes to sell over the weekend. So both of them were quite busy. Uh, my dad uh, worked uh, as a painter and uh, he had uh, people that worked with him. What I liked about uh, his entrepreneurial uh, flair is that he was in charge of his own destiny. You know, he, was un he wasn't answerable to anyone. Uh, he just made sure that uh, there was food on the table and the family was taken care of. And I liked that. Uh, I think that influenced uh, what, who I became because I really always wanted to work for myself. I wanted to be in charge of my destiny. And yeah, I think uh, that influenced me a lot. But also my mother's hustling uh, uh, style of uh, making a living and uh, just not having any time that's lost. I also uh, took that up and uh, that's how I live my life even now. My dad, he just made us feel like queens and kings. And uh, he had one special trait that I haven't actually seen anywhere else. You never knew who was our dad's favorite. You just, I just didn't know. I was the last born and I did very well at school, better than my siblings. But still, I wasn't sure if I was the favorite. Uh, our brother was the, from my mother at least, was the only son. So you think, mm, maybe. And my sister was the first born. So, but he had such a special ability that I haven't seen anyone 
achieve that, including myself, of uh, actually not showing favoritism to anyone. He loved us to bits. And uh, we needed our mother, though, because I, our dad, dad just allowed us to get away with anything. And uh, our mother was very strict. Uh, I think it influenced uh, how my mother actually brought us up because she had to overcompensate uh, because our father would just let us uh, do anything and get away with so much. So my mother was the disciplinarian in the family. And uh, yeah, so they were very different. Uh, but uh, I'm grateful to both of them. Both of them showed us love. But uh, I think the discipline that uh, I now have came from my mother because she was the disciplinarian. Uh, but the love, uh, which came from both, but it actually, you know how it is with girls and their fathers. Uh, I'm definitely a, a daddy's girl. And to this day, I can hear my father. Actually, I can see him more than hear him. I can see him giving me this teddy bear hug, uh, kissing me. I can see him uh, pouring a uh, tea. He loved tea and uh, I love tea to this day. I, that's what I got from him and my mother. So he had this big father's egg, the cup that is labeled father. I think my mother got it for him. So he would actually pour a uh, tea onto this saucer and uh, I would actually sip from this. Those are the special moments I remember when I think of my dad. Having a father figure in a family is uh, very important for both boys and girls. Uh, boys look up to their fathers especially to validate them, uh, to make them feel that they are okay. And uh, girls uh, love their fathers to just shower them with love. And uh, the relationship they have with their father, uh, I believe almost influences the type of relationship they have with their husbands if they happen to get married. And um, I think what they look for in a husband is uh, materially influenced by the relationship they had with their father and also just the type of person that he was. One of the memories I have uh, of my childhood is Saturday mornings. My mother used to wake up around 4 a.m. Uh, she would go to the market to buy groceries, uh, vegetables and fruits and um, also fish, there was a fish market next to the market in Devon where I'm from. And uh, she would come back and cook this big breakfast for us. And uh, those were special uh, breakfast moments uh, with the family. And uh, my dad loved his meat. And uh, yeah, if um, my mother used to get fed up that you can't have meat all the time, you know, sometimes you must have just vegetables. And she wouldn't cook um, meat one dinner and my dad would just go and buy meat and uh, make sure that there's meat all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Though I knew from a very young age that I would be a doctor, I know for a fact it was from the age of four. But I can't really say to you this was the day and time that I actually made up my mind. What I know though is the influences around that decision. Uh, my half-sister that we stayed with uh, in the earlier days of my childhood, uh, she was a professional nurse. And she was the type of person who will come home and talk about what happened at work. And one of the things that she used to talk about is just what the doctor said. And it seemed to me that people followed the instructions from the doctor. And uh, being the control freak that I am, I loved uh, actually giving instructions and people uh, being the decision maker, if you like. Uh, but one uh, day that stands out very vividly in my mind is uh, at the age of four, I had to start school uh, because my mother, the person that was looking after us, left uh, the, the household and my mother had to take me with uh, to school in the, with the understanding that I'll just park in one of the great uh, not uh, classes, but then I started to learn. And uh, on this particular day, my dad wasn't well, and my mother said, well, you'll have to remain behind and make sure that uh, the doctor comes to see your dad and your dad is looked after. And uh, here came this doctor, I remember it was Dr. Kavashe. He had a beautiful car, well-dressed, and he made my father better. And uh, I do believe that from that moment on, I actually thought, this is who I'm going to be. Uh, seeing a black man that is in charge of his destiny, that works for himself, and they uh, have healing powers, I thought, I want to be that person. And it didn't matter to me that he was a man. I didn't see it that way. It was just an African person who was in charge of his destiny. This was in the late 70s. Uh, we really had one option. We could go to as blacks. 
we could only go to the medical school at the University of Natal, what is now called UKZN. Uh, so I applied like everybody else and uh, got accepted. Uh, I have to say that's one of the highlights of my life. When uh, you dream of this, uh, of becoming this person from the age of four, and then you get this letter that says, indeed, you can actually come and do medicine. And yeah, and um, what a journey. A medical school for me was very challenging, but uh, it was like uh, an extension of your family. Uh, the guys and the girls that I was with uh, up to this day are like brothers and sisters to me because there was this camaraderie uh, element to it. Uh, it was during the dark days of apartheid, so we used to actually rebel. We used to, we, we had a if we had a cause to fight, you know, the liberation of our people. Uh, of course, part of that liberation was liberating your mind uh, by making sure that you become a professional, you don't become the domestic that you were meant to be. So, yeah, medical school was special, and I remember uh, on one of, of the occasions where we were actually exercising uh, our, how do I call it, struggle for freedom, uh, I think um, the apartheid government was going to hang uh, three ANC members and uh, we decided that we were going to hold a night vigil. This was in town and the plan was that after the night vigil we would actually walk all the way from town uh, to King Edward uh, where we actually studied. And uh, I was one of those unfortunate one, uh, ones, unfortunately, that were held by the police, were chased uh, by the police dogs and uh, I was beaten by the police dog and yeah, I ended up uh, in a charge office, police charge office. And uh, the funny thing though is that when I was there waiting, um, this was what, 1983? Uh, beginning of 1983, I got married at the end of 1983. So when I was there, all I could think of is my goodness, when I come out of this prison, uh, my boyfriend will be gone married to somebody else. <laughs> So anyway, the rest is history. It was so interesting that uh, in the final year class, uh, I just remember being asked the question and apparently uh, a lot of other final year students had been asked the question. Uh, so how many of you are going to specialize? And 95% of the class, and I was part of that 95%, said, oh yeah, of course we'll specialize. And it's only 5% that said they were going to be GPs. But uh, the thing is, uh, when I was in final year, I was already married and our son uh, was a year old. Uh, so the reality was that I actually had to come out and help my husband. He was an article clerk then, uh, pursuing uh, the CA qualification. And uh, my mother had been single-handedly funding my education. And uh, yeah, it was difficult for her. It was difficult for my husband, so guess what? I had to come out and uh, go into private practice, and that's how I went into private practice. But uh, I always had this dream that I would specialize, but that would mean uh, I would have to go on intakes. What, what that meant is that you'd be away from home for 36 hours. So I had to make the conscious decision that uh, my specialization, my studying has to actually take a back banner and uh, I have to be a good wife and also a good um, mother to my kids, uh, but also just uh, try and uh, help my husband to make sure that we have a family that uh, had the things that we aspire to have. Having uh, grown through the dark days, uh, one of the things that really got to me is uh, just not being able to vote and uh, just feeling like, like you know, we're called these many different things and I hated that with a passion. Uh, up to this day, I just want to be called an African. I just want to be called an African, not black, no, just African. Because we are called plurals at some stage, we are called non-Europeans, we are called Bantus, and all I wanted is to be called African. So came 1994, uh, I remember I, we had uh, both our kids uh, by then, and uh, one of the best moments of my life, or maybe the best day of my life, is joining that queue and waiting patiently to cast the vote. Because that did, what, what that did to me is just to bring back my dignity. Uh, people don't realize that, uh, yes, money is important, yes, rights are important, but for me, dignity is 
everything, you know. I just wanted that dignity to say, I'm an African and this is my country, you know. So yeah, 1994, what it then also meant, uh, I was a doctor practicing at that time, but I had started looking at business and uh, just thinking of uh, what, uh, what else there is in life, you know. And uh, I remember one of the first things that I did was uh, it just felt like the world was my oyster and I could be anything that I chose to be. And uh, one of the things that I did, I registered to uh, study, um, you know, how the JSE works, uh, how do you invest on the JSE. And uh, there was a guy that had a stock, a stock brokerage firm in Johannesburg and uh, he came to Deben to give classes. Uh, it was evening classes for a week or two, and uh, he used to allow you to play with the uh, fake money uh, so that you just get to the gist of how you actually invest on the JSE. And uh, it also involved uh, buying a business day. Uh, I had a practice in the township, and those days you couldn't get a business day from the township stores. So I had to drive during lunchtime to what used to be the airport at the time. And I remember the business they used to cost about 250. But uh, inside the business day, up to this day, you have that uh, those pages that actually show the different sectors uh, on the JSE and the closing price, the opening price, and so forth. So you had to understand that to understand uh, investing on the JSE. Yeah, and then I also formed a company called Busa Women Consortium, uh, which uh, intended to make investments, which indeed uh, we did. Uh, up to this day, we have one of those investments that we did in 1994. So I'm a doctor, and here comes 1994, and uh, you want to put deals together, you put together this women's group, Kusa Women Consortium, and uh, the more you look into this, the more you listen to the corporate finances of this world, is the more you realize, my goodness, I know nothing. And one of the things that used to concern me is that, especially because the trend during those days was to buy into existing uh, big uh, companies, and you would have a corporate financer who's advising you, but common sense just tells you that if there's big business and small business that's just starting up, and you want to return business, whose interests are you going to cover? In my view, it's the big business uh, uh, interest. It doesn't help if the small business person like myself doesn't understand what really makes a good deal a good deal. So I've always believed that in life, everything can be learned. So that informed my choice to actually go and do my MBA because I thought if I do this MBA, it will actually give me an overview of business, be it uh, finance, be it uh, human resources, marketing, you name it. And uh, it did just that. Uh, it was such a learning curve. It was such a learning experience because in a business class, as you would imagine, you have so many professionals. You have engineers, you've got lawyers, uh, maybe one or two doctors and accountants. and it's really a melting point of so many different aspects, so many different perspectives, and uh, you learn so much from that, from the case studies and the approach that each of the people within the class actually have on anything. For me, I actually observed my parents when I was growing up. They both worked, and they actually, they took each other as partners. I remember when they embarked on a project, like my dad, uh, one of the supplement, uh, well, he supplemented his in income also uh, by buying property. He bought property in those few areas where Africans were allowed in the country at the time. And he would then build flats and uh, he would have rental income from those flats. But uh, each time they embarked on a project, like maybe they had to build those flats, they would actually have this meeting where each one would say, okay, how much do you have? Uh, this is how much I have. So. I learned from a very young age that as a wife, you are a partner to your husband and uh, you actually need to make sure that you support them and they support you uh, to actually achieve uh, the dream that you have uh, collectively and individually. My husband and I started going out uh, from high school. So I'm grateful to Maranil High School because that's where we met. Uh, but uh, as you can imagine, we're young, 14 and 16. And um, the funny thing is uh, we had been going out just for three months 
He was my first boyfriend, and I knew this is the one. The only struggle I had is like, damn, I mean, he's my first boyfriend. He's still going to have so many girlfriends, and uh, maybe we'll break up. And anyway, my husband is so disciplined. I have never met anyone as disciplined as this. He's extremely disciplined. He's hardworking. He actually, at this time, he must be doing this. At that time, he must be doing that. And uh, I've actually learned from that. I'm very ambitious. I've always been ambitious. And uh, I'm also very disciplined, but not as disciplined as he is. And, uh, but uh, I've actually, it's interesting that I think uh, though it's good to be different uh, as a married uh, couple, uh, because your strength at least is complemented by maybe his weakness. But uh, I think it helps if, especially your value system is similar. And uh, then also you, you don't want to be, how do I put it? Much as you learn from each other, you should allow who you are to actually shine through because you don't want to be emulating somebody else. Uh, you are happiest when you are just being true to yourself and being the person that you are meant to be and uh, having learned whatever good qualities that you can learn from your partner, but you still have to be true to yourself and be authentic to who you are meant to be. I find that it actually helps if you grow and aspire together. And I find that if you actually, even if you choose to pursue to be wealthy, uh, you create wealth together, uh, supporting each other. Uh, I think uh, you appreciate each other more if you actually build from nothing together. And uh, for, for me, I, I actually find that because this is when I, we started with nothing and whatever we have, we actually have contributed uh, in equal measure in terms of effort uh, to actually make sure that uh, our families uh, are taken care of. Uh, I remember going back to um, our alma mater and uh, buying uh, laboratory equipment for the physics laboratory, amongst many other things that we've done to give back and uh, also to make sure that the education of those that come after us uh, is quality education. Uh, when it comes to the CSI that we do as a family uh, through Mkiwa Trust, uh, we support schools, uh, we support uh, bursaries for different uh, professions actually. Um, so it was no surprise that uh, when Siswe left First Run Group as the CEO, he actually decided that his focus, the family's focus uh, led by him, will be in private education, private quality education. Uh, it took no less than two years. Uh, we went to all corners of the globe. We went to Europe, we went to North America, we went to South America, we went to the continent. Uh, just to try and find the best model uh, that would actually uh, tweak to make it local, make it relevant uh, to the local uh, African child, but uh, at the same time preparing the African child for the 21st century and preparing the African child for African leadership, for being uh, innovative, because we believe that uh, quite a few of the models in terms of education uh, do not really give you thinking tools. Uh, it's re regurgitate and uh, you can't solve problems if that's the model, model that uh, you actually are exposed to. So for you to be able, uh, for us as a continent, to be able to raise and uh, ensure that we have the youth that is innovative, that create the jobs themselves rather than seeking jobs, it's quite important the type of education uh, that we give them. That actually gave rise to future nation schools uh, under Sifiso Learning Group that my husband heads. And um, the first two schools actually were opened at the beginning of 2017. And uh, it really is our pride and joy to, to be able to say, we are actually doing something that will change uh, the future of so many children, uh, not just in South Africa, but in the continent. I always say uh, to young people that uh, a marriage is really teamwork, it's a partnership, and uh, the team is as strong as the weakest link. And uh, so you actually want to be strong for your partner. And uh, more often than not, you find that 
uh, though you're actually working hard as a team uh, to contribute to the success of the family, uh, you are at different times and at different levels of success at different times. So uh, it's important to be always there for your partner. And uh, sometimes you won't understand their dreams, but it's important to support those dreams because the last thing you want is to have someone who's not fulfilled uh, because you stood in their way and didn't allow them to be the best that they can. Uh, I really believe that as a partner, your job is to allow the next person to be the best that they can. But don't neglect being the best that you can too, which is quite common with women. There's this uh, belief that you're just there to support your husband. Uh, yes, you have to support your husband, but in my view, God made you for a purpose and he made you a complete person with your own aspirations, with your own purpose in life. So as you support your husband, as you support your kids, remember not to allow allow your dreams to die. I've always loved fashion. I just couldn't afford it. Uh, I remember when I was at medical school, I used to have this dream that, oh my goodness, I wish I had this aunt and I would just be called uh, with the delivery at medical school with the clothes in them. Obviously, that wasn't going to happen, though I didn't have a rich aunt to do that for me. Um, I never saw fashion as a business for me, uh, but uh, when I was invited uh, by Kanye in 2012, uh, to actually be one of the founders of Luminance Ventures. Um, I said yes. Uh, at the time, I didn't see it as a, one of my major investments. I saw it as just a side investment, and uh, I would sit on the board as a non-executive director to help with strategy. But as things would have it, uh, one year down the line, I actually had to take over and um, uh, run uh, with the Luminance Ventures project. And uh, it's, been, it's been fun, it's been fun, it's been hard work, and uh, I'm very grateful to the staff that I have and the managers that I have in the team because they make it fun. And uh, we actually building the brand, uh, Luminance. It, it's been four years now. Uh, we started with the flagship store in Hyde Park. We now have one in Santin. We have a pop-up store in Menlin Park and uh, we opened a monoprint store also at Jimmy Choo and we have two platforms there uh, online. One is a, an outlet, St. Lumilux, and the other one is the main store. One of the things that uh, we did uh, when uh, I took over the, the running of Luminance is to increase uh, African designers. Uh, within uh, the stores. Uh, so you have the David Lallers uh, next to the Oscar de la Rentas. Uh, you have Claire Chic, uh, which is a young uh, company uh, that is stocked uh, within the Luminance stores. We have La Duma, uh, Makosa, who actually is very true to his uh, own ethnic uh, background in terms of the style of his uh, designs, which is based on the Kosa uh, designs and tradition. Uh, so I, I, I truly believe that as Africans, uh, we need to sell uh, what's, what's actually unique to us. There are so many things that are so unique to us, that are so special, that uh, we actually need to go global and uh, building those brands that are so truly African. I really believe that young people have a lot to learn. In 2016, we actually were so grateful that as Mbegani, we finished 20 years. Um, though I started business well before then, like I spoke earlier about Gusa Women Consortium that I started, uh, that has investments, and uh, one of the investments is still uh, giving returns to shareholders as we speak. Uh, but I started Mbegani in 1996. And um, as a doctor, you always start with what you know. You know, I specialize in occupational health. So one of the first things that um, Begani embarked upon was occupational health. And uh, we were offering executive medicals, occupational health to different businesses in different sectors. Uh, so what started as uh, just uh, two employees uh, has now grown and we have a 20 year history that we're proud of. 
We offer different things. One of those is actually just investments. As indicated earlier on, 1994, I decided to understand how the JSE works, and they have made investments uh, under the umbre Mbegani umbrella. We have investments on the JSE where we have a portfolio of different sectors within uh, that investments portfolio. But in terms of operations, which I believe is very important, uh, especially for, for the young people, it's great to have investments, but we have to start somewhere. And operations uh, are, are very important if you are to succeed. And you have to find that that works for you. We started with um, surgical instruments, uh, which we import, and uh, also running of the sterile services uh, using Mbegani Health uh, at the Inkosi Albert Lutwili Hospital. Uh, we have always loved property. We are into property. We own commercial property, and uh, we manage uh, the properties that we own. Uh, but we also have a facilities management company uh, that uh, employs uh, security. There are different uh, divisions within that facilities management company. There's security, there's cleaning services, and uh, there's landscaping. Um, and uh, going forward, and of course, there is the fashion retail uh, through luminance. Uh, going forward, I see us uh, continuing, obviously, with the investments, and uh, which is uh, half uh, pharmaceuticals and uh, the health uh, side of things, which is my bias because I started my life as a medical doctor. But uh, I see us growing more on the property side because uh, that's the passion that I would like to pursue. What I've learned uh, in the past uh, three decades uh, that I've been in business is uh, the things that are the key drivers of any business, or at least the success thereof. Uh, one of them is finance. Uh, the other one is talent, ensuring that you have people who are committed to your cause, who are committed to the vision of the entrepreneur, uh, but uh, who also have uh, the skills that are required. And uh, obviously, if you're selling anything, be it services or products, you need a market for that. Uh, so it becomes quite difficult. Uh, I'm sad to say that in 2017 still, it's still very difficult to access funding, especially if you're black and it's even worse if you're a black woman. And uh, so what I advise though is that uh, you actually need to start with things that you understand empower yourself with knowledge uh, on the product or the service that you actually wish to offer, ensure that there is a market for it, and uh, start small, uh, at least that has been my experience, because the failure rate uh, of startups is very high. So it's very important that you start small and make sure that whatever you start with is sustainable because one of the things I've learned is that as a startup, when you think you need 100 rand, guess what? You actually need 300. So actually just making sure that you don't spend uh, what you make, uh, you actually make sure that you save. Uh, if you can get funding, that is great. But if you can't get funding, sometimes you need to uh, get uh, some funds from what you've saved, uh, which means that sometimes you actually need to stay in employment and try and in invest uh, quite a bit and save quite a bit on what you make from your employment rather than just starting out without really having some uh, cushion that you'll use uh, to survive those difficult times that every business goes through. If, if you choose to work hard and you choose to be focused in what you do, uh, there's one thing that uh, it is such a luxury, that's time. So how you spend the time, because once it's gone, it's gone, you can't recycle it. How you spend the time uh, depends a lot on how you prioritize things, you know? Uh, neither my husband nor I play golf, and uh, you'll find that uh, because we have limited time and we have so many ambitions and so many things that you would like to accomplish in this lifetime, you actually then say, okay, what are my priorities going to be? And for us, those priorities have been family and business. So the business becomes your baby and your family, obviously it starts with family and then everything else. And in our case, it's business. Uh, obviously you compromise because uh, you compromise on friends, spending time with friends, 
but that's a conscious choice that you have to make if you are to do what you believe you have to do. I, I always say uh, when it comes to my business, uh, we, we are not corporate in the sense that we see ourselves as a family and uh, I truly believe that uh, the core, the pillar of every family is a value system. So for us as a company, for us as a family, uh, each one of those two are built on a, an ethic, a value system that has to be common for it to succeed. Uh, I think uh, families that are built on a value system uh, that is strong, uh, that is actually shared by everyone, tend to be strong families, you know. So I think as uh, the custodians of families, as parents, both mother and father, uh, it's important for you to be authentic. It's important for the other members of the family that look up to you to understand who you are because if they don't get who you are, then they don't know what to follow. And uh, I think really authenticity and being true to your value system is the foundation of our families. If I look at uh, the people that I was with in primary school and who were much brighter than myself, uh, I think one of the biggest or the best characteristic to have is ambition. Because when we are ambitious, nothing actually gets you down. I've met uh, people that lost both their parents to HIV AIDS, uh, but today some of them are doctors, some of them are uh, engineers. But one of the common characteristics in my view uh, in the people that make it in spite of all the odds, especially people that come from rural areas or people that come from the townships, is the ambition. Ambition obviously has to be paired with hard work and focus. And uh, to me, and also grit, you know, resilience, uh, just withstanding whatever comes your way because life being life, you'll always have challenges. You'll have so many things that will push you back. And uh, in my view, uh, when you overcome those challenges, you're stronger as a person uh, than you were before you had those uh, uh, challenges. I'm a dreamer, as I said earlier on. Uh, one of those dreams was to have a PhD, and uh, that was informed by going to one uh, graduation ceremony and uh, seeing a lot of people with uh, black academic attire. And I remember there were just three that had uh, the red academic attire. They happened to be all males. Uh, what was special though was just how the whole scenario, the whole process changed when it came to the graduation, actually the capping of the, the three guys that uh, were receiving their PhDs. There was a short paragraph that was read uh, that happened to be the dissertation that their PhD was on. And uh, yeah, for me, that was so special. I've always wanted to do better. I've always wanted to be different. So to have that red academic attire amongst the sea of black academic attires uh, built the seed in me that I want to get that, I want that. But then life happened, you know, I was busy uh, raising my family, I was busy trying to create wealth for my family, and it actually seemed so selfish to just have something because it would make me feel good. But uh, I, I actually registered and each time uh, I would then find something else to do uh, because I chose not to prioritize it. The thing, the day that changed is when my son passed away because all of a sudden I realized that damn, if I had thought life was long, I realized just how short it was. And uh, it also reminded me that, you know, each one of us is here for a purpose. When you leave this earth, you can't say to the maker that, no, 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 hey, I was busy with my daughter, I was busy with my husband. You know what? Your maker made you for a purpose. And if you feel there is something that you're not doing that you were meant to do, that there's a dream that you believe that you, you need to earn it, and you, you don't allow yourself to do that, you owe it to yourself to change that. You know, you have kids, and they, they make you happy. You're actually grateful that you have them because it's not everyone who can and the guy above decides these things. 
But then you get grandkids, oh my God, best thing in the world. There is nothing that makes me as happy as Makeda does. She's just the best. Uh, so for me, it's always very important, it's always been important that they achieve academically, uh, they have at least one degree, or oh, if they have the second one, thank you, you know. So uh, it was a bit difficult with our son because he didn't like school exactly, but uh, you know, he got his uh, uh, BCom degree, he also got his honors degree, and that made me so, so proud. For each of the graduations, eh, I bought a special dress because eh, each time I see that dress, it brings back that pride and joy eh, that I actually had on the day of the graduation. Eh, but the other thing that really made me proud about our late son is just eh, his integrity. You know, he was such a, he was a special person. He had so much integrity and that to me is very important. My daughter, uh, sure, she, she's the apple of my eye. Uh, she's just done everything right. You know, she's passed every exam she's ever written. And uh, I was actually quite uh, apprehensive when she was writing the board exam to be a CA, because I know uh, the failure rate is high, uh, but again, she passed part one, and again, she passed part two, and uh, she got married, she got a child. So, I am so grateful to God rather than being pride, proud to be honest because raising children is really a trial and error. There's a lot of luck involved. So I can't really say there's something special that Sisu and I did, but I'm just so grateful uh, to our kids for just doing the right thing and making us happy. When I completed my book and uh, it came out from print, I wrote a message on one of the books and I'm hoping that uh, Makeda's parents will give this to Makeda uh, when she's old enough to understand. Uh, what I would love Makeda, I'd love her to love herself. I pray that she learns to love herself from an early age unconditionally. I would love uh, for her to know that she is, she can be anything she chooses to be and uh, she can achieve anything. Uh, I would love her to be true to herself uh, and forgive herself, you know? Uh, as women especially, we tend to, to be hard on ourselves. When we, mistake, when we make mistakes, which we do like anybody else, uh, we tend to be hard on ourselves and not forgive ourselves for making those mistakes. I wish for my granddaughter that she forgives herself from the mistakes she'll make, and she learns from those mistakes, more importantly, and that she goes out of her way every day of her life to serve her purpose. For me, that's so important. Yeah. I'd love Sizwa to know that um, I love him, and uh, I'm always there to support him, and I will continue to do that. And uh, yeah, I'm proud of him. I'm proud of that shy young boy, what he has become. And uh, yeah, it's been a beautiful journey. I pray that it continues to be a beautiful journey. My daughter, Ganyezi, I'd love her to know that I love her deeply and unconditionally. I am so, so proud of her. And uh, I just pray that uh, she is happy, throughout her life. I pray that she leaves her purpose. And uh, I actually pray that uh, when her soul uh, leaves earth, that uh, it's a soul that she's proud of. And when that soul mix, makes, uh, meets its maker, uh, it's actually a life well lived. I would define myself as someone who values integrity and uh, believes that it's important to live a life that actually ensures that whatever you do uh, has integrity, uh, how you live your life has integrity. And uh, I would like to, if I had to choose how I would be remembered, is that I was true to myself at all times. When you leave, you 
you just do what you know, you do what you believe is best at the time, and uh, you leave legacy behind. I don't think, personally, you are aware what legacy you leave behind till you're gone. And uh, because I, I, I believe that your kids are not your legacy, the kids live their own lives and live their own legacy. Um, in terms of what I leave as a legacy, uh, it's just the person that I was, I believe. It's just the things that I did to impact the life of others. Uh, the legacy I leave is different for each person that I touched, uh, whether it was directly or indirectly. Uh, for each person, it would be a different legacy. Uh, someone would say, I love that she was true to herself. Uh, I loved that it mattered to her uh, how she empowered you and if she empowered you. So I, I really believe that the legacy is quite broad. It's as broad as the different people that you touch uh, during your lifetime.